Can anybody give me an example, just raise your hand, of a personal decision or, or lifestyle choice that you could have to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions or GHG emissions and help mitigate the worst impacts of climate change? Yes. Drive less. Drive less. Wonderful. I saw a hand over here. Great. Not having children. Okay, I'm not going to tackle this one in this speech. <laughs> and one more? Okay. <laughs> so um, some of the more frequent responses that I might, I might encounter are things like flying less or reducing one's meat consumption or perhaps uh, switching your utility to one that produces or generates more uh, renewable energy for your procurement. But what if I told you there was something simple you could do that could have 21 times more impact than all three of these things combined? Now, what I'm about to tell you is in no way an endorsement to go ahead and fly all you want, eat all the meat you can, and waste energy. That's not what I'm saying at all. We need all the help we can get. But that's how much the Make My Money Matter campaign estimates that greening your pension or switching your pension to a low carbon option could have an impact on your financed emissions. Now, what does that mean, financed emissions? Well, when you contribute to a pension, your money doesn't go, isn't locked away in a vault somewhere waiting for you to grow old so they can give it back to you. No, that money is invested. And it's invested in companies and assets. And the operations of those companies and those assets go ahead and generally use energy and emit carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. So those are the financed emissions of those pension plans. And by extension, those are also your financed emissions. For example, a recent report by Kushan, a UK-based fintech and pension business, has estimated that the average investment in a UK pension plan finances around 23 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. That's like saying, that every person who contributes to that pension plan goes ahead and burns 940 propane gas tanks or burns 1,100 coal fires per year. It's a lot of, a lot of finance emissions. But there is good news. A lot of asset owners and asset managers, pension plans included, are trying to reduce their finance emissions. And in fact, some have been even so ambitious to go ahead and set targets to reduce their financed emissions to net zero by 2050. These include big groups of institutional investors like the UN Convened Asset Owners Alliance with around 50 signatories, $6.6 .6 trillion in US, US dollars in assets under management. Another one is the, is the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative with 128 signatories and a whopping 43 trillion US dollars in assets under management. So this is very good news. And it's very important. Setting commitments and setting goals are the first steps to making real progress on reducing finance emissions and transitioning the real economy towards a lower carbon state. But now comes the hard part realizing those commitments. As a climate change specialist in the financial industry, I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to harness the immense power of capital markets in the service of combating climate change. And it's less and less a matter of trying to convince the industry that something needs to be done. And it's more and more around helping the industry, helping them understand and giving them the tools that they need in order to go ahead and put their money where their mouths are. So what does an investor need? What does an asset owner, asset manager need in order to make this radical shift in how they manage their portfolios? How does an asset manager know which companies are taking real action to reduce their real world emissions? Which ones are placing uh, energy efficiency programs, reducing their waste? procuring renewable energy. They need information. And in particular, they need comparable information. 
But the problem is, comparable information is difficult to find when you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions data. Oftentimes, this type of data, if you can find it, is built up from information like corporate sustainability reports. And they're generated in the context of that reporting. And so they grab whatever data they can, some from top down, bottom up. They fill in, that, they fill in data gaps. They don't track which, which data is estimated, which is not. They don't know how, or as, a, as an audience, you don't know how they estimated that data or how they aggregated up to that corporate level. So it becomes very difficult for investors to make credible decisions based on that data. So let me give you an example from the industries in which I work, which is real assets or real estate and infrastructure. So I work for a Netherlands-based company and we collect sustainability data on real assets globally. And we collect that data, we standardize it, package it, and present it in a form to investors so that it's decision useful for their investment making decisions. And each year we collect data on about 120,000 assets globally at the building level. And we collect data on things like where those buildings are, what type of property type they are, how much energy they use, how much water they use, how much greenhouse gases they emit as well, how much waste they produce. But we also go more granular. We go, okay, well, where are they getting this, this uh, energy from? Is it from the electricity grid? Is it from district heating and cooling? Is it from on-site on fuel use? Are they bringing in off-site renewable energy? Are they generating on-site renewable energy, et cetera? And based on our 2021 data, we found that 45% of those 120,000 buildings that report to us, only 45% were able to give us complete greenhouse gas emissions data. 22% could give us some of that data, and the other 33% had no greenhouse gas emissions data whatsoever to give us. So you can understand, as an investor, trying to make decisions based off of radically incomplete data, especially when you're trying to identify those assets that you should be engaging with and trying to talk to those building managers about retrofitting and energy, energy efficiency programs and the like. So let's try and conceptualize this data challenge and what it means in physical reality. If we were going to go ahead and assume that the buildings for which we don't have greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas data are, operate somewhat similarly to those for which we do have data, then we're missing around 100 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. So let's take that a step further. If we go ahead and assume that the data challenges that we experience in commercial real estate over a 5.7 trillion uh, US dollar portfolio are somewhat similar to the data challenges that are experienced by, let's say, the $43 trillion under the control of the Asset Managers Initiative, then they might be missing somewhere on the order of 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. To put that in context, those missing emissions, if you were to say that those were the emissions of a single country, then the World Resources Institute would place that as the eighth most highly emitting country in the world. So what do we do about this? Well, I think we need less data. And in particular, I think we need less self-reported greenhouse gas emissions data. We don't need these fund managers to waste their time and energy, paying generally consultants to go ahead and try and configure the greenhouse gas emissions information that is generally used for corporate reporting and try and like fit a square peg into a round hole and make it useful for investment decision making. Instead, we can actually do that ourselves. We can actually build up 
from the most granular level. Those emissions from where they actually arise from, their energy usage. And so we take the energy consumption profiles of these buildings and we can estimate those greenhouse gas emissions. And what's more, we can do it in a consistent, robust, standardized, industry-backed, and radically transparent way. So by the time that information gets to the investor at the highest level, they know exactly what went into that data. They know exactly how much of it was filled in by estimation. And they're more confident to take decisions based on that data. So, you've probably realized that the answer isn't necessarily less data in and of itself. It's actually kind of a byproduct of the real solution, which is greenhouse gas accounting standards. So in the same way that financial accounting standards are globally recognized, and so you can look at a balance sheet or a cash flow statement or an income statement and know exactly how each of those numbers were calculated and aggregated up. The same thing can and needs to be done for greenhouse gas emissions data. Okay. So, you know, what will these greenhouse gas accounting standards do? Well, they do a number of things. First, they provide a carrot for the industry, an incentive. And the carrot says, you investor now have confidence in this data. You know exactly how it was built up. You know exactly what's in this carrot. So you can make more confident decisions to go ahead and allocate your resources to those buildings and those companies that are becoming more sustainable. So it's better decision making. The second thing it provides for the industry is a stick. And the stick says, you investor no longer have an excuse not to take action. You can't hide behind the excuse of, oh, I don't have the greenhouse gas emissions data. Or I have it, but I, you know, I don't know how it was estimated, so I'm not that confident in it. I can't make decisions. No longer will that be allowed to fly. And the combination of this carrot and stick will move the industry away from kind of the realm of voluntary corporate sustainability reporting, which is susceptible to things like greenwashing. And it will move it more towards a reflection of something that reflects actual real-world performance and how companies and assets are actually impacting our environment, backed with all the robustness of something like financial accounting standards. So those investors that fail to move along in this direction from left to right will soon find that they'll be left behind. In evolutionary biology, they call this the Red Queen Hypothesis. And the Red Queen Hypothesis simply says something like, it doesn't matter how long a species has been around, that species has a roughly equivalent probability of becoming extinct at any given time if it stops adapting and continuously evolving in step with all of the other species that are co-evolving around it. And the Red Queen hypothesis is an allusion to Lewis Carroll's 1871 uh, sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, in which the Red Queen says to Alice, now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Those investors that do not adapt, that do not adopt robust greenhouse gas accounting standards will soon find that their peers are making better decisions than they are and they will be held accountable. In evolutionary biology terms, they will go extinct. And as they do, things like net zero pensions will not only become more widely available and accessible, but they'll also become more impactful. Now, a lot of us don't have a choice on which pension plans we are able to contribute to. This is often a choice that lies with our employers. 
But there are ways that you can raise this issue in the workplace. And there are places like shareaction.org that go ahead and have resources to help you do this. But something like greening your pension, it's more than just multiplying your impact by 21 times. It can actually do something more personal for you as well. It can give you peace of mind. Because no longer will you be relying on everyday lifestyle decisions to prove and reprove your commitment to something like the fight against climate change. You've already done the heavy lifting. So the next time you're confronted with the vegetarian option, I know we've all been there, and the meat option, the vegetarian option, doesn't look so good. It's kind of a sacrifice. Uh, but the meat option, if I were to choose that, I would single-handedly be exacerbating the global climate crisis, producing a lot of anxiety at the dinner table. But it will do is it transforms the situation. And that vegetarian option, the, the voluntary, the agency you feel, the action of choosing that vegetarian meal transforms from an act of guilt towards the planet to an act of love towards it. No longer is your action a single insignificant action lost in a sea of eight billion other actions. It becomes a momentary manifestation of your values for you to cherish and for you to enjoy. It goes ahead and reduces that cognitive dissonance that some of us feel between our actual selves and our idealized, super sustainable, Instagrammable versions of ourselves. It'll allow us to go live our lives out in the world. So let's make sure we're financing a better one. Thank you.